Welcome to Arizona Community Church's online service. We are so glad that you've joined us. My name's Andy, and I want you to know that if you're new here, there's a place for you at ACC. Now, if you have a prayer request or a question, you should just scan this code with your phone. It'll take you right to the right place. Well, in a moment, Pastor Bill is going to tell us what kind of news is the most important news for us to pay attention to. But before we get to that, why don't you join us in some awesome worship and praise to the Lord. church. Will you guys stand with us? I'm going to pray and we're going to start worship. God, thank you for being so awesome that you designed something like church, that we all get to be your family and your people to gather in your house and sing songs of praise to you. We give this time to you. Um, just bless this time in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to start with a new song, so be forewarned. We're all in it together. God who 
Arizona Community Church. Would you just turn and give a friendly wave to the people around you? Let them know you're glad to see that them here. Then you can go ahead and have a seat. Well, so glad to see you all here today and for everybody joining us online as well. My name is Brandon. I am the associate pastor here today. And it's just such a beautiful day out today, isn't it? Such a good day to be here at church. Hey, we have a lot of stuff coming up here at the church, by the way. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance yet, I'd encourage you, grab your bulletins, look over everything that we have in there. There's so many different things coming up. I don't have time to mention them all this morning, but there's just a couple that I want to highlight uh, for you. If you notice on the very back, uh, right off uh, on the top left side of the bulletin, it says Youth Parking Lot Sale. That is next Saturday in the South parking lot. Is that the South side, right? South parking lot. There's going to be a high school sale. Am I right back there, Ryan? Yes? No. It's going to be in the North side? Oh, it says it wrong in the bulletin. Okay. It's going to be in the North side, the other South side. Yeah, that side. Okay. See Ryan. He knows what's up. 
So he'll take care of it. Um, but the, the, the high school ministry is putting out a huge parking lot sale. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we're raising funds for students to be able to go to, to summer camps. Uh, and so uh, if you've been around this church long enough, you may know that there's an awesome family that donates a lot of uh, supplies and, and brand new items to the church that then we are able to sell and raise money uh, for our students. So if you want to get your hands on some really great stuff, there's like k- cooking stuff, kitchen stuff, home stuff, all sorts of cool things. Uh, they're going to be selling all of that next Saturday between 7 and 11. 11. Is that right? That's correct, though. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Um, but they're all in the back, too. You can talk to Ryan sometime. Uh, they're going to be selling all that. It's a great way to get some new stuff and help send some students to camp. It's an awesome opportunity. So next Saturday, invite the whole community. Anybody's welcome to come. Uh, it's just going to be a great time. Uh, so put that on your calendars next Saturday. Also coming up, Um, And it may not be as pertinent for this service, but our choir is starting back up. That usually sings during our first two services. And so if you are interested in that, uh, please see Dr. T. He's going to be starting that up coming this Wednesday. So if you have been a part of the choir and and, uh, you're ready to come back, or if you are interested in that, uh, please uh, reach out to Dr. T, our new uh, worship director for our first two hours. Um, He'll he'll take care of all that. Uh, Also... Um, we have our motorsports day coming up, which is really exciting. There's going to be a ton of awesome cars. If you saw the trucks that were parked out here on the plaza on your way in, that is just a little preview, a little taste of what you're going to have on motorsports day. Uh, we're praying for over 200 cars, all sorts of classic cars and brand new cars, all sorts of really cool stuff. It's just going to be a really great time. That's going to be April 17th. So mark your calendars for that. And if you have a car that you would like to, uh, to bring to the show, Um, please reach out to us. We're looking for extra cars to bring in. Or if you want to serve in any ways, let us know and we'll connect you uh, to Michael Reuter, who's who's overseeing all that and planning all that. It's going to be an awesome time. So let's pray and then we will continue in worship. Father God, we just thank you uh, for this morning, for the time that we get to be here. Lord, like that song said uh, that we just sang uh, from the book of Job, that Lord, you give and take away. And we love the you give part, but the you take away part is hard. But there are ups and there are downs in life. There are good times and there are bad. And Lord, you are good and you are God through all of it. And you have our best interest at heart. And you know exactly what we need and when we need it and what we need to go through. So God, we just thank you that you are so good to us, that you are so great and glorious. And we just want to continue to worship you now, Lord, because you are are deserving of all of our praise and honor. Lord, we love you, and it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Please stand with us as we continue singing in worship.
people. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing.
Amen. Was that awesome? Hey, would you go ahead and grab a seat and would you join me in prayer as we prepare our hearts for God's word? Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day and God for the opportunity to worship you amongst the saints and lift your name on high. And God, as we go to your word now, we pray that it would come alive to us and God, that we would feast on it, that that living word, that active and living word, God, would shape and transform the very people we are to our core. And God, that we would leave here with, it might be a new outlook, a new perspective, a new attitude, but God, that we would leave here changed people. Thank you for each person that you have brought here today. Thank you for everybody that's watching online. And God, thank you for this church. We love you and we thank you and we pray these things in Christ's name. And the church said with me, amen, amen. This feels a little hot to me. This mic feels a little bit hot to me. Anyway, it's so good to see you guys. My name is Bill. I'm the lead pastor here at Arizona Community Church. If you're new with us, thank you so much for being here and checking us out. We know that coming to a new church can be really intimidating, but I think you'll find us to be a pretty friendly church. And uh, we are just so glad that you are here. Now, here's the deal. We're in the middle of a series in First and Second Thessalonians. And if you know anything about the books of First and Second Thessalonians, you know they broached the subject of the end times. Don't miss the next couple of weeks because this is where we're going to start entering the end times stuff. And um, as a matter of fact, you're going to see even in our passage today, it mentions the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. So we kind of broach it a little bit today. Uh, so just don't miss the next couple of weeks because it's going to be awesome. Well, there is no doubt that uh, there is a force at work in this country that has a lot of influence and it's called our media. It is our media. Um, I, uh, m some of you know this, most of you might not, I don't know, but I got my undergrad degree uh, in journalism from Sacramento State University, so I know something about, uh, a little bit about journalism. The media in our country is, uh, it has become powerful, to say the least. It can easily affect everything from political races to foreign policy issues, as well as race relations to economic issues and everything in between. You name it, and the media can and will affect it. Do you agree? Yes. As a result of having so much power, there seems to be a little bit of a growing distrust of our media in this country. And so I'm going to take a risk. I did it in the other, the other ones. I'm just going to do it here to kind of find out where you are. How many of you have a distrust of our media in this country? Well, surprise, surprise. It's like 100%. Yeah, all, just so you know, you're right in line with all the other services. Um, there is a growing distrust of the media. Now, some people will blame the politicians or people like that. Uh, the, the news has been labeled fake news. Others blame the media itself, and this is kind of where I lay the blame, for being so politically partisan themselves. Listen, when I was a young journalism student in 1989, 90, 91, 92, it was incredibly biased back then. The media has a slant, and it was even on my local school newspaper uh, that you could see it being manifested. Um, whatever the reason, the media is no longer trustworthy in many people's minds. Believe it or not, there was a day and age, some of you won't even know who this is, but this was considered the most trusted man in America. How many of you recognize that? Yeah, that's Walter Cronkite. As a matter of fact, ASU's uh, named their... their um, their journalism program, there's a Walter Cronkite ASU journalism program that you can be in. Um, some actually blame him because he started taking, a, started voicing his opinions about the Vietnam War and blame him for the, the media moving from neutral uh, to a, a little bit more biased. But whatever the case, um, we're a long ways from this, aren't we? We are a long ways from these days. There's no doubt that the media can greatly influence people on a very real and practical level. People's attitudes, their perceptions, their behaviors can be influenced with news reports that are literally coming at us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's no other generation that, got, that could even perceive of the amount of information that you and I get on an hourly and even minute by minute basis. It's truly incredible. And believe it or not, whether you know it or not, there's a good chance that you're addicted to media because I know I am. Um, and it happens subtly, but suddenly we become news junkies and we can't live without up-to-the-date, up real-time minute news. And uh, we have been conditioned to do that. Now, that may not be you. Um, that's good if it's not, but it happened to me where I became just a news junkie. Um, in the old days, and I guess I'm, I'm old in this, in, in this congregation to, for some of you, but in the old days, you had to wait till you got home from work to watch the news. How many of you remember those days? And then you had to wait till the next morning to get this thing called the newspaper. By the way, I'm just curious, how many of you still get the newspaper? Yeah, there's always holdouts. You guys, you're strong, stay strong, don't give up. Yeah, don't give up. There's nothing like that newspaper. 
Yeah, in the old days, you had to wait to get the news. When I grew up, uh, my dad, um, he, was, he would watch the news, and, we, and he, we'd watch it in front of the TV. We were just a TV. We gave into that, and I loved it. But we would watch the world news. Pardon me. We'd watch the, local, the half an hour local news, half an hour of world news, and then the nightly business report every night. He had the controller, he had the best seat in the house, and you watched what he watched, or you didn't watch TV. So we would watch the local news, the world news, and the nightly business report. And I grew up on that as a regular part of my diet, if, you will, if I can say it that way. But now, fast forward to today, where you can get literally real-time, to-the-second news reports on everything imaginable from all over the world. It's incredible. Some of us, some of you that are younger can't appreciate what the, older, what the older people in this congregation can appreciate is it wasn't always like this. We live in a crazy time where information is flooding on, on our phones and before us on a regular basis, and it can affect you in real time. Listen, there have been times I have woken up in a good mood, come to church, clicked on the news, looked at it in real time, only to have a bad attitude in real time. <laughs> I got a bad attitude in real time. I'm like, ah, you know, just ask the staff. You know, I walk in, I'm pleasant. I go click on the computer and then all of a sudden I'm mad. I think most of you would agree with me that having 24 access to real time news from all over the world is at, ver at the very least, it's a double-edged sword. Would you not agree? It's a double-edged sword. It's nice to be in the know, but being in the know can become addictive. But being in the know can also cause a whole lot of stress, a whole lot of anger, a whole lot of depression, a whole lot of fear, a whole lot of anxiety, and the list goes on and on. Would you agree with me? I hope, I hope you would. Listen, this is important. This is important for us as Christians. Um, news can be toxic if we're not careful. The news we take in can be toxic if we're not careful. But I also want to say, if there were ever a time for the church to shine, it's now. In a generation of people that are addicted to news and are... Um, being affected by news in real time, the church has an opportunity to stand apart as different. We interpret the news different. We look at the news different. We're focused on different things. What's important to the world isn't important to us. And what is important to us might not be important to the world, but we stand apart as different in this generation because of the way that we handle news. Now, why do I tell you all that? Because in our passage today, we see the Apostle Paul, who has been experiencing a ton of persecution, positively transformed by good news about things that really mattered. I'm not even kidding. This passage is so easy to overlook, but as we unpack it, I pray that it comes alive and it, tr it really transforms the way that you look at news and the way that you think moving forward. So you ready? Here we go. Church, it's my honor to take us to the word of God today. We'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6. Unfortunately, I chose a smaller font or a different font this week, so it's a little bit small. So you're not getting old, it's just the font's different. So here we go. First Thessalonians chapter three. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live. If you are standing fast in the Lord, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, and here's the, the end time stuff, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And we're going to get into the end time stuff starting next week uh, in full force. So in our passage, Timothy is acting as a first century news reporter. Why do I say that? Because that's how it opens. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought to us good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Timothy is a faithful news reporter. He's a faithful news reporter. He's somebody that you can trust. He's the most trusted man in the first century when it comes to news reports for the Apostle Paul. Listen, folks, as believers, we have to understand a very important truth. Timothy isn't just bringing any kind of news to Paul. He's bringing good news of eternal matters. 
He's bringing good news of eternal matters. And if you get nothing from my message today, I suppose get this right here, folks. There's no better news than eternal news. There's no better news than eternal news. And I say that because as believers, as long as our eyes are on this world and taking in the things of this world, the news coming out of this world is going to affect us. Expect nothing more than a steady diet of news that is sure to depress and distress, if that's where our focus is. If we are taking in and addicted and consuming all the news that is being set before us, like the rest of the world, expect to be depressed and distressed. But if we make what God is doing our priority, the kingdom that we see advancing before our very eyes, then the news that we're going to get is going to be a steady diet of good news of God changing people's lives before our very eyes. Amen? God is at work. Do you see it? I'm not so sure the church does. I'm not so sure I do. And you want to know why? Because I'm addicted to all the wrong news. I'm addicted to all the wrong news. That's exactly what we see happening in our passage. Timothy brought Paul news, different kind of news. Listen to this. The news that Timothy brought Paul by all worldly standards seemed rather insignificant and irrelevant. But Paul recognized it for what it was. It was good news about eternal matters, and that transformed Paul. Look at the news that he brought. Here's the news that he brought. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news. Now, what's the good news? It's going to be amazing. It's going to be life-changing. Here's what it is. Of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us. Why is that important? Here's why it's so important. The good news that Paul received from Timothy about the church in Thessalonica, about their faith and love and about their longing to see him, wouldn't even be considered significant enough to make it into a neighborhood newsletter. But it's on the pages of scripture. Think about that. This would be insignificant news by any worldly standard, and yet God put it in the pages of scripture. Let that sink in for just a moment. Let that thing sink in about what type of news should be affecting us. It was significant of God to put it in there. It's just incredible. It's a powerful reminder that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Listen, the temporal news that men often deem of great importance is often but trivial in the mind of God. We turn on the local news, the nightly news, and we think, oh my gosh, look at all that's happening. Trivial. What's really significant is the person that we ran into the store or at the supermarket or the neighbor that we have that we're sharing the gospel with or that we blessed somebody or prayed with somebody. That's eternal news. The news that God is excited about is the news that we should be excited about, and that is God reigning in the hearts of people. God's transforming gospel, changing people from the inside out. If a small group of Christians living 2,000 years ago in Thessalonica Standing strong in their faith is headline news for God. If it makes it into the Bible, it should be important to us. That's the type of news that should transform you and me. What's truly heartbreaking is the amount of stress and anxiety I put myself through for no other reason than I'm constantly focused on temporal worldly news. I'm an addict, and it's true. I am, and I didn't even see it coming. I never thought it would happen, but I became a news addict. Despite the fact that God is, work at all, he, God is working around us all over the world, all over the place, all the time. His eternal purposes are being accomplished, and yet I'm, off, I'm often oblivious to it. Why? Because my face is buried in the internet, and it's not up watching what God is doing in my very presence. And ironically, you know what I do? I pray. When I pray, I say, God, why do I never see any good news? There's never any good news. And God must be thinking, Bill, what is your problem? There's nothing but good news before you. Do do you not see me at work before you? And my answer is no, I don't, because I'm looking at all the wrong news. I'm fixated in taking in temporal news as if it's the most important news that I could ever hear. Now, don't get me wrong. The news that is unfolding on on the world news and so on, God's in control of all of that. But here's the deal. We interpret it different from the world, don't we? Listen. Many of us are concerned about the state of the country, and we think, wow, the country's going down a path that w- that's concerning to many of us to the point where the church might be persecuted. Now, the world, from a worldly perspective, we might take that news in and go, that's a bad thing. The church is going to be persecuted. But what do we think as Christians? We think just the opposite of the world, don't we? That could be the best thing that ever happened to the church. 
a little bit of persecution, a little bit of hard times coming upon the church could actually be great news. We don't look at the world and interpret the world, the worldly news as the world does. When the church is weak, who's strong? God. Absolutely. That's why Paul says, I rejoice in my hardships and my trials because when I'm weak, then God is strong. Listen, if you turn on the nightly news and it says this country's going down the tubes and that the church might be persecuted, don't let your heart be troubled because God works all things for the good of those who love him. Amen? Including his church. And so we can look at that news and the world will go, oh, things are getting bad. And we'll go, praise God. He's only going to show himself strong through us. He's only going to show himself strong through us. It's learning to think different. It is learning to think different. I really do mean that. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Being a Christian is all about learning to think backwards. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So if you want to get in tune with God, start thinking backwards. I've said it before. If you don't know what the Bible says, if you're not sure what God thinks, just think what the world thinks. Think what your flesh is telling you and think just the opposite. And there's a good chance you're going to be close. You're going to be in the ballpark of what God actually thinks. Listen, folks, if you can master this one skill to learn to think backwards, to learn to look at everything from a biblical perspective and not a worldly perspective, you will look at everything different. You will interpret everything different. You will be affected by everything different. When the world is running around in a panic, you will be people of amazing peace. Think about this. If ever there were a time for the church to shine in a world that is addicted to news, it's now. The world is watching the news and is stressed and depressed. And they should, they're looking at the church and we're just like they are. We're stressed and depressed. When we should be going, hey, God's at work. And they're going to say, well, this means bad things for the church. So be it. Because when we're weak, God's strong. And they're going to go, wait a minute. You don't think like anybody I know. Exactly. Because I'm a Christian and I don't think like you. I don't think like the world. I'm training myself, be it ever so difficult, as difficult as it is to start thinking like God, to start thinking backwards, to start thinking thoughts that are different from the world around me and the people around me. When the world is stressed and depressed, you will be filled with joy and hope. But only if you and I mature in our faith to the point where what is eternal is more important than what is temporal. Where what God is doing is more important than what man is doing. And don't be mistaken, folks, there's nothing easy about it that. There's nothing easy about it. I'm a pastor and I struggle with that. I really do. I get to work at a church for heaven's sake. And by the way, a lot of people go, well, you're a pastor. You know, you're a, you're on the front lines. You know who's on the front lines? You are. You're the heroes. You guys are out in the world. I get to come to a church and work at a church. I don't know why I'm telling you that. I had a point there, but I lost it. So I'm not sure what it was. But the point is, I guess, is that just, I forget, forget what the point was. Oh, we're talking about maturing in our faith. It, it's hard for me even as a pastor. Um, I get to come to a church and it's hard for me um, to, to fall into that trap. Even the most mature believers can get sucked into temporal thinking where the temporal crowds out the eternal. We just don't want that to happen. Listen, this is so important. What was most important to the Apostle Paul was not the Caesar who was reigning in Rome. It was the God that was reigning in the hearts of those that he had just witnessed to. Paul was, nowhere does Paul write or is concerned about who's reigning in Rome. He wants to know who's reigning in the hearts of the Thessalonians. And when he gets that news, he's excited. He's excited. And I'm going to tell you guys right now, just take this to the bank. The church does not need any political party for our success. We do not need a political party. We do not need any laws. We don't need anything. The kingdom of God will advance. It doesn't matter what system you put it under, what system is against it, what rulers are against it, what politicians are against it. The kingdom of God is going to advance just fine. Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It will start as small, the smallest of all seeds, but it will grow to be the biggest of all plants. That's exactly what's happening. And the kingdom of God has come up against every political movement, every political leader, every type of system and philosophy that you can imagine, and it has done just fine. It has done just fine. Paul was not concerned about the Caesar sitting on the throne in Rome. He was concerned about the Lord that was sitting on the throne in the hearts of the Thessalonians. That's the type of news that is headline news for the Apostle Paul in the first century. That was what he wanted. He did not send Timothy to Rome. He sent him to Thessalonica. He did not send him to Rome to find out who was on the throne. He sent him to Thessalonica to see who was reigning in the hearts of the people he had just ministered to you. 
Folks, that should be the type of news that is headline news to us in this generation. When the world looks at the church, they should see us not consumed with worldly news, stressed and depressed just like everybody else. They should see us focused on a kingdom and the news coming from heaven, not Washington. The news coming from heaven is what should get us excited and sustain us in this generation. We are part of a kingdom that this world is not a part of. And we are following a king that is greater than whoever's sitting in the Oval Office or whoever's sitting in the Kremlin. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, one of the things that I think this generation needs to do, this generation of Christians living in, the, in America right now, is we need to transfer our allegiance from this country to our king and his kingdom. Now, don't get me wrong. I love this. This is the greatest country God ever produced. I really believe it. And I want the best for this country. I really do. But my allegiance, first and foremost, is with my God and his kingdom. He is my king. It is so incredibly easy and so incredibly tempting to make what is coming out of Washington, the news coming out of Washington, more important than the news coming from heaven. That's why I entitled this sermon, You Get to Choose. You get to choose the news that's important, the temporal or the eternal. Listen, folks, you not only get to choose the news that's important, you get to interpret the news. You get to choose how you interpret the news. And like I said, when you watch the news at night, and the world is going, whoa, 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 stop yourself and go, wait, the world's saying, whoa. <laughs> What's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is God's at work. God's at work. Well, whoa, the church is going to experience tar- hard times. What's the opposite of that? God's going to show himself strong even in the midst of a valley. Amen. You get to choose the news that's important. You get to interpret the news that you get. Interpret it from a biblical perspective. Look at everything from a biblical perspective. Folks, your citizenship is not in this world. Kingdoms come, kingdoms go. Presidents come, presidents go. I don't know what the future of this country is, but I do know what the future of our king and our kingdom is. It is going to be the one kingdom that lasts, outlasts all other kingdoms. If you want to make the worldly, temporal, trivial news that you, get, that you can get on a 24-hour basis important to you, go, at, go for it. Have at it. But please do not be surprised when you're stressed, angry, and depressed in real time. At the end of the day, you get to choose. So choose wisely. So choose wisely. Do you want to know, by the way, just how powerfully eternal news can affect you when you focus on it. When you get focused on the kingdom that truly matters, do you want to know just how much you can be impacted? It's in our passage. I don't know if you picked it up. Let's go back to it. Look at verse 7. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, more on that in one second, in all of our distress and affliction, we have been, what's that word say? Comforted. You guys do have good eyes. We have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live. I'm alive, Paul says. You want, you want to know what fires my engine up, Paul says? It's this. If you are standing firm in the Lord, that's what fires my engines up. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God. Now, look at this. In all our distress and affliction... What is Paul talking about there? The same guy that wrote this passage right here also wrote this passage out of Corinthians. Listen to it. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers. Danger from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger from the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. In toil and in hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Question for you. How can a man who experienced all that write this? That I, in my distress, am feeling great comfort and joy. I'm on fire because of what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your lives. The reason that a guy who wrote this can write this is because he's focused on what truly matters. He is focused on his king and his kingdom. Does that mean that Paul never got news out of Rome or what was happening politically in Rome? I'm sure he did. I'm sure he had opinions about it. But I guarantee you what drove this man was the news that was coming from the throne of heaven. The news that was coming out of Thessalonica. He did not send Timothy to Rome. He sent him to Thessalonica to find out what these people were doing and how they were doing. 
Listen, folks, if the Apostle Paul can be comforted, encouraged, and overflowing with thanksgiving, despite having gone through all of this, then I ask you, what excuse do you and I have for not being a radically different people in this generation? If ever there were a time that the church could shine, it's now. In a world that is addicted to, the, to, to worldly news, stressing out and freaking out over what's coming out of the no, local news, we have this awesome opportunity to stand different. That when our neighbors are stressed and depressed, we're rejoicing. And they go, why are you rejoicing? Because my God's at work. And his kingdom's advancing. Everything's just fine. Come and be a part of this kingdom. It's an awesome opportunity to invite people out of the stress and depression that this world has to offer and invite them into a king, to, to meet the king and be a part of a kingdom that's going to last forever, that's perfect in every way. Is, let me ask you a question. Is God not at work today as he was in the first century? He's at work just as much today as he was in the first century. As a matter of fact, because the church is far bigger and far more reaching in its ministry than in the first century, you could make the case that you and I have more eternally good news happening before our very eyes than in Paul's day. Couple that with the fact that we don't have to wait months at a time to hear what God is doing. You understand for Paul to get news of the eternal, he had to send Timothy on a quest back to Thessalonica. That meant weeks away, months away from Timothy, and he had to wait patiently for that news. You and I don't have to wait for anything anymore. We can hear about what's happening at the church in China or North Korea. We can hear what's happening about what God is doing in this church and the women's ministry and the men's ministry. We can see it before our very eyes and get that information immediately. Please tell me what excuse do we have for not being the most comforted, encouraged, and overflowing people with thanksgiving in our heart in this generation. We should be. People should look at us and go, those Christians are different. The world's falling apart and they're totally stable. The world is falling apart and they've got peace in their heart. How is that possible? Oh, they have this little secret. They're citizens of another kingdom and they're really obsessed with the news coming out of that kingdom. They don't really focus too much here. They don't let this stress them out that much. That's the secret. By the way, do you want to know what is really amazing about temporal versus eternal news? Is you get, to write a you get to write the eternal headlines that will happen in this generation. You get to make, you get to help write the eternal headlines that are going to happen in this generation. So from a worldly perspective, listen to this. From a worldly perspective, we all have limited time, limited resources, and lim limited opportunities to impact the events happening in this world that we see being reported on the news. We have limited ability to impact what's happening in this world, right? Sure, you can vote, you can sign a petition, you can march in a rally, but what overall impact that will have on events happening in this world is hard to tell. After all, your vote might not be counted. Your petition may get thrown out in court. Your rally might not get reported on, or if it does get reported on, it will probably be reported on in a biased way. But you want to know what is so incredible about what is happening in the eternal realm? You can impact what's happening in the eternal realm on a scale that your mind can scarcely comprehend. So in our passage today, Paul isn't just comforted and encouraged and overflowing and his engines coming alive because of what he's hearing. He is an active participant in what's happening. Look at the, the passage goes on to say, and we, Paul's praying earnestly night and day that we might see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Paul's like, I'm praying to get back to you so that I can minister so that you can be strengthened in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. I spend, I think, far too much time praying that the right person end up in the Oval Office than me being directed back to the feet of people that I should be ministering to. Let that sink in for a moment. That's just me. Paul is earnestly praying laboring diligently and using the gifts that he has to impact people. He didn't want to get to Rome. He wanted to get back to Thessalonica to impact these people. Goes on to say, um, by the way, imagine if you had access to the White House. Imagine if you had access to the White House whenever you wanted. If you had the president's ear, you might be able to affect some level on some change, don't you think? Maybe, maybe. But we all know that's never going to happen. Most of us would be hard-pressed to get access to the local mayor's office, let alone the Oval Office. It's a pipe dream that you and I will ever be in the Oval Office. Even in the local mayor's office is a pipe dream for many of us. It just won't happen. We won't get that sort of access. But you want to know what's amazing? 
Guess what you do have access to? The throne of God. You have access to the throne of God. You will never, most of us will never be in the mayor's office, let alone the Oval Office, and yet you can go before the throne of God today and talk to the God that puts senators and presidents in their place. And you can ask him to start using you to do great things in this generation. Listen, folks, life is short. Please listen, life is short. You are but a breath. You're here today and gone tomorrow. That's how quickly life is going to go. I know it feels like it's going to last forever. It's not. Whatever you do, do not waste your days obsessing about temporal, trivial things. Labor for that which will truly last. Store up treasures in heaven. Serve your God and be generous towards him while you can. Listen, even if we had access to the White House whenever we wanted, we're running up against a president, whoever that might be, that is limited in power, limited in resources, limited in everything. So often we make the president of the United States out to be this, he's the most powerful man in the world. Yes, but he's still very limited in his powers. But you know what's, who's not limited in his powers? Yeah, the God you and I serve. Folks, you and I cannot out ask or we cannot outdream what God is able to accomplish through us in this generation. Start asking him to do great things with you. Start asking him to use you to write eternal headlines in this generation, headlines that will last into eternity. You, will, you can vote and do all you want by a worldly standards, but I'm telling you, when you labor for the kingdom of God, you are writing eternal headlines, and those headlines will scream into eternity, will last into eternity. As pastor, as a pastor, I tell people, you know, pray big. Pray audacious prayers. But never forget this, guys. What is audacious to you is not audacious to God. He can do anything, day or night, anytime he wants. You can't out-ask what God is able to do. Ask him to do great things with you in this generation. By the way, it was significant enough to God that you and I be allowed to participate with him in affecting this generation that he sent his son to die for us, to give us that privilege. Do not miss that opportunity. Don't waste that opportunity. Listen to me. I'm going to end with this. You are going to go home, and you are going to be inundated with news. Your, your phones right now are probably buzzing because you're getting the headline news. I get them. There's another headline that just came in. You know, I got to look. Got to, you know, got to feed the addiction. Be different. Be a different people in this generation. Let's be a different people in this generation. Let's be a people who are focused on eternal things and who get excited about what God is doing from his throne in heaven, not what the president is doing from his desk in the Oval Office. Amen? Interpret the news different. Choose the news that you listen to and choose what's important to you and get excited. Let your heart and mind and life get excited about what truly matters. And I guarantee you, you will shine. We will shine as a different people in this generation. So the challenge is very simple. Make it eternal news that ignites your engine. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you. And God, we thank you so much for the Apostle Paul, for his life, and just God, the godly example he set. Here he is, God, in the first century, not worried about what's happening in Rome, but concerned about what's happening in Thessalonica to a small group of people that had received you. He sent Timothy, God, and patiently waited for that news. And when he got it, he was transformed despite what he was going through. God, may that be us. May that be us in this generation. May we be excited about the eternal. And stand apart as a people on fire for what truly matters. And may people flock to us. May people be thirsty because they get around us and they taste the salt and they see the light that is shining through us because of our focus on you and on your kingdom. God, make us sold out in every way. Help us, God, to write those eternal headlines. God, use us in great ways in this generation. Help us to labor for the right things. So, Father, we love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, real quick. We have a mask-only service later on today at 4 o'clock on the plaza. You're welcome to bring people that m might need that service, but I need some men to help me set up the chairs on the plaza right now. So if I can get a few men out there to help set up chairs, God bless you. You guys have a great day. We'll see you right here next week. End times. Don't miss it. God bless. Well, once again, thank you for watching our broadcast. We truly hope that you were blessed by it. Also, a reminder, if you have a prayer request or a question, simply scan this code with your phone, or you can find us at az.org.
www.thepeopleofgod.church. That's all we have for now. We'll see you again next week.